John 10.10. 10. It's your yellow bookmark. <clears throat> and it says this. You know this verse. You've heard this all your life. The thief cometh not, but that he may steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. That's the American standard. And here's the King James, almost exactly the same. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The thief's job is to steal. That's all he can do. All he has ever been able to do is steal and kill and destroy. And the devil is the supreme thief. But every thief upon the earth, every human being thief, is a subcategory. It's like a subdivision of what the devil does. The devil's activity to steal and kill so that and destroy. And although not every thief might be a murderer, every thief has his own well-being in mind and he does not care about those he takes from. It's a terrible thing to be bound by the spirit of thievery, to take what is not your own, because it not only sows a seed of killing and stealing and destroying, but it reaps it as well. The next verse is Galatians 6, 7. You have heard this one a lot too. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that all shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. So much in this world <clears throat> is about sowing and reaping. This is why it says just keep doing the right thing and in due time you'll reap a good harvest. But for those that are doing the wrong thing and they're stealing, then it just keeps on reaping that bad harvest. If you've ever known, especially a family that has this unclean spirit attached, it's a family curse. Things just never get better. It's like there's always some kind of a challenge repeating over and over and over again. Think how you would feel. Say to you, David, pretend that you gave me your wallet. And you said, I've got to go out somewhere, and I'll be back shortly. Would you take care of my wallet? And I would say, okay, David, I'll watch your wallet for you. And I just said it right there. And in a little while, somebody came up and opened your wallet and took $10 out and left. They didn't take everything. They just took $10 and left. How would you feel when you came in? I'd say, somebody took your money. You'd say, I thought you were going to watch my wallet for me. And you would be disappointed that I wasn't faithful and allowed the thief to come in and take what was rightfully yours. He stole what belonged to you and you trusted me to watch it, and I just watched him do it. You know, in the law, if you don't prevent something from happening, you become what is called an accessory. The bank <coughs> robber who's got a girlfriend in the passenger seat, she may not even know that he's going in to rob that bank, but when the cops come, they arrest him, and then they arrest her for being an accessory to the crime. That holds true in the spirit realm also. And the law of sowing and reaping holds true in that. That if you're not doing something to prevent iniquity, you're actually aiding and abetting. If you're in a position, especially if you are a trustee who's been given a position of, um, of trust from someone to watch over something. Okay, over here, as we have been studying about the courtroom, we have been learning that scrolls are very important. And in uh, the spirit realm, all through the book of Revelation, we hear about different scrolls. And a scroll happens when a verdict is passed from heaven. And I want you to look at this verdict. It's your pink bookmark, the light pink one, over in Zechariah. You know this is not the first time we have been in Zechariah in this study. And today is our 11th lesson, so we've only got about four more, five more. 
<clears throat> and we're through. Okay. Um, line scroll indicates a verdict from heaven. Zechariah 5 3. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. Now, a scroll has just been opened. Let's go back one so you can see the setting for the verse. Then I turned, first one, then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. That's a scroll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. It has an immeasurable size. There's a front and there's a back. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off. Oh my, did you all know that? As on this side, according to it. And every one that sweareth, <clears throat> excuse me, shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. This is how it reads in the, um, the Amplified. I just copied these now. I did a screenshot on this. New King James is good on this one. This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. And every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of the scroll. It, so we see here that these are the kind of decrees that we are dealing with when we are trying to set the captives free. If we can determine either by a word of knowledge from the Spirit or by natural knowledge, they might have it in their uh, confession or in their uh, testimony, that they have thievery in the mind. And if we can identify it, then we can identify why everything is going wrong. The thing is, sometimes there's a bondage called kleptomania, where people feel compelled. Last week, Mom found someone who probably had that going in the thrift store, stealing a 50 cent necklace. You know, and, and she had the 50 cents in her pocket while she was doing it. But it's the thrill to see if she could get away with it. The problem is, for 50 cents, look at the curse that she brought upon herself and her family lineage until somebody somewhere could stand up in the court of heaven and repent for that iniquity and ask for mercy and exoneration. And this is what we've been looking at all month, are different facets of the uh, different sins and the particular bondage that it brings. Now this one has two sides. On the first side it's stealing and on the second side it's perjury or um, what is it in the King James? Um, swearing. And I looked that word up in the um, Strong's and it literally means seven. It's like you say it seven times. It's not just regular lying. But mm -hmm. it's a lie that is reinforced and reinforced. You say, uh, did you take that? And they say, no. Did you take it? No. And they reassert it over and over. And this kind of perjury is the backside of that scroll that brings this curse into family lines. I have known some of these families. And I have done my best to bring them to the place of repentance. But there is a stronghold here and I believe that it might even take some prayer and fasting to break that stronghold but the persons themselves have learned how to get by by their wits through these things that are unholy and thievery and so that, that it's a survival method it's a survival mode that they enter into and after a while their hearts become hard I don't even believe that they know how to recognize it as iniquity. I don't think they feel guilty anymore. I think they got by so many times their conscience has become seared, and that is a terrible place to be. What we want to have is a soft heart that is saying, search me, O God, know my heart, and show me any iniquity, and before I even hear what it is, I'm ready to turn from it. I'm ready to repent, and I'm ready to ask you for mercy. 
I posted something on Facebook this week I liked so much. It was a cartoon character, and the man was bowing at uh, his bedside praying. And he was saying, God, we don't deserve your mercy. We have sinned against you, and we have done wrong, and we have uh, brought so much uh, evil in, your, in this land. But I pray, nevertheless, for mercy. Now that's a prayer of petition, and that's a prayer that will reach God's heart because he knows we don't deserve anything but the wrath of God. But that's why he sent Jesus, because he had so much compassion for us that he wanted to be able to extend mercy. And when Jesus fulfilled all of the, uh, re the, all of the um, law, then he could extend mercy to the whole human race. It's like what we were talking last week. The first Adam fell by becoming rebellious and independent. The second Adam, or the last Adam, Jesus Christ, brought us into, uh, brought the way clear so that we could find God again because he prayed, not my will, but thine. He surrendered his heart. Uh, Wayne Warmack sent out a YouTube video yesterday of the man who played the part of Christ in The Passion. Did any of you all see that footage? It was really good. Uh, the man testified about how that uh, when he was playing this role, he got hurt so badly. He got his arm dislocated, and when they were whipping him, Mel Gibson was the director, and he tells these Italians who speak another language to do it like a baseball, and they don't know what baseball is, so they do it like this game cricket over there, which apparently is a flying run, and then they let it go. Well, this cat of nine tails, or the replica that they were using, hit the actor and slit an 11 inch wound oh. into his back. And it's like, he didn't even have to act at that point. The poor man was in such agony. He was 33 years old, and his initials were JC. Uh. He kept saying that he was not worthy to play this role, but the Lord said, are you willing? I'm not calling you because you're worthy. I'm calling you, are you willing? And he said that he would do it. And he learned so much about submission to God as he played this, this role. And then he testified, and he said to this congregation of Americans, he has a British accent, I know the words from, but he said, it's not about the serving God if he will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's not about this deal that so many Americans have the idea, I'm going to serve you, and now I want you to do everything for me, as though he's a Christian Santa Claus. It's something more than that. He, Although he does give us blessings, and we are very grateful for our blessings, that is not the point of focus. The point of focus is that are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to take up the cross, deny yourself? And this young actor said, it's time we suck it up. He got the idea, and he got it firsthand playing that role as they slid his uh, back open and he had a dislocated shoulder anyway and when they did the cross scene and they dropped that cross into the earth his shoulder just kept coming out I mean and and he had he had to have heart surgery after the fact a doctor even told Mel Gibson that he could die if he finished this scene he could die and so uh, Mel Gibson just asked him what he wanted to do. He says, I'm ready to lay my life down. If this will pull people into the kingdom of God, I'm ready to lay my life down. He had a near miss. He's a young, healthy man. He's just 33 years old. He's uh, younger than most of our kids. And so we see here that um, God had a plan, and it was twofold. It was to evangelize. They, t they uh, gave the figures on the gross sales of that movie. It's the highest grossing movie. I had no idea. I couldn't watch it because I couldn't deal with the graphic part of it. But, but I supported it because I wanted those who didn't believe to see it and to see just how bad that it really was. And it was a very realistic depiction in a lot of places. When I heard what he went through, I was very convinced as well that it had, had done a good work and that he had received something at a personal level as well and that his Christian life is completely turned around. He has no focus at all on collecting stuff uh, and just, you know, the more, the more, the more. And no doubt he got a lot of money from that if it had those, that kind of box office sales. But the point was it got him to looking at what's really real because Amen. he was ready to lay his life down and came so close to it. 
So here's a word of encouragement that the other side of, um, of all the self-promotion, the underlying spirit behind thievery, is the Lord's work in us, where he tells us, if any man will be my disciple, do you really want to be my disciple? Do you really want to follow me? Or is it just for the loaves and fishes? We can't help but see that the tide, anytime you have free anything, you can draw a crowd. Uh, anytime you you preach, uh, well, look at the best the best churches in America are the ones that are preaching pie in the sky, <laughs> you know? The ones that talk about uh, there can be a price to pay, and there is, there is a price to pay. Some are greater than others, but if any man will be my disciple, let him take up his cross. It's true for all of us. Paul said, all who live godly will suffer persecution. It's a part of the package deal. We should come into this thing with that mindset that there's going to be a price to pay, and yes, we're willing to pay it. We're willing because take the whole world, but give me Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We just sang that this morning. Okay, how do you respond to the word no? I think it's off by is it on? Okay. How do you respond if somebody says you can't do something that you want to do? This will tell you something about yourself. I can't tell you, but you can tell yourself. Proverbs 9, 7. It's the hot pink bookmark. It says, this is for the person that's in the, uh, the other seat. He that reproves a scorner gets to himself shame. And he that rebukes a wicked man gets himself a blot. What did Jesus say? Don't cast your pearls before the swine, lest they turn and rend you. So there is something to that. Don't, don't give that which is holy to dogs. Do not cast your pearls before the swine. This is the same thought process as here in Proverbs. In verse 8, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. However, look at this, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will get yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Amen. And look at 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me, that's by wisdom, thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, and if thou scornest, thou alone shall bear it. So he's doing a contrast here between these two thought processes. Either we can be teachable or unteachable. But if we hear the word no and burr up, then that shows us that there is a rebellious spirit there that needs to be dealt with. If we hear the no, the word no, and say, well, okay, we'll try again next time, then that shows that we can roll with the punches. And that's what we want to have. I'm getting out of the screen, Bob. I'm, I'm leaning too far over. Okay, so reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Do not cast your pearls before the swine. The orange bookmark. Do you love the praise of men? Do you love to hear? What a good job. And, it, and there's nothing wrong to say nice work. I'm not saying that. But do you feed on praise? This is a dangerous place to be. Because if you feed on praise, you will also feed on um, the lack of it. If you get praise, you're high. But if you don't get it, you become low and depressed. You'll be like a yo-yo back and forth. No solid place at all. But we must be to the place where we do not let it touch us. Look at what the word says. Jesus is speaking. How can you believe? How can you have faith? Which how can you who receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? If we are looking for brownie points and affirmation, and we're looking for somebody to build us up in order so that we'll feel good about ourselves, then we're going to be to going to the exact opposite when they go. Jesus said, how can you have faith if you're seeking this honor that comes from people? This is a mystery, but somehow in the spiritual sense, whenever we are uh, seeking for God's favor only, it builds our faith. When we're seeking for the uh, success in the world and we're seeking for the approval of people, 
it causes us to have diminished faith. And I'm talking as Christians. And, and, and just multiply it out if it's about unbelievers. Okay, the last text we have today, we're coming full circle. Isaiah 42, 19. I love this verse. And this has been one that has encouraged me for so many years. Whenever there is so much bad press, whenever there's so many who haven't encouraged this work. I, don't, I was telling Bob the other day, I do not need somebody to come up and pat me on the back and say, nice job. But what I do need people to do is say, I wasn't very close to God last year, and now I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I need Amen. to hear. Amen. I need to hear people say, I was sick, and Jesus touched me, and now I'm <clears throat> I need to hear that God is doing the work and that his kingdom is coming and his will is being done in the earth as it is in heaven. But I do not need somebody to come and tell me a nice job. They don't even know what I'm doing anyway. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 42, 19. Green bookmark. Beautiful green bookmark. 42, 19. And here it is. Who is blind but my servant? This is talking about Jesus or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he hears not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. What that means is he will take our old stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. Hallelujah. So that we don't Amen. just mechanically <clears throat> obey the Old Testament as they did in old times, but that we will have a new spirit that directs us there and leads us there in the ways of righteousness. Who is blind but my servant? What's he blind to? He's blind to flattery on one hand, and he's, he's blind to criticism on the other he cannot be moved for e by either one because these two forces, although they seem to be diametrically opposed, they accomplish the same thing. And that's the destruction of our faith. These two things destroy our effectual walk with God because they're taking our focus off of Him and putting it on ourselves. So we must hate flattery, we must hate criticism equally, and just listen for the voice of the Lord Amen. and his name will be honored his law will be honored in us Christ in us is the hope of glory and it's still not by might not, not by, by power but by, by my spirit, spirit saith the Lord. Lord everything we will ever get comes from there okay. everything we'll ever get and all of the success that we have in the kingdom will be because I'm my beloved and he is mine. That's right. His banner over me is love. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. 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 Be blessed. Let's dismiss. Oh, we're early, Bob. You can go ahead and get this here. Father, we thank you for this message today. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, proclaiming this work into the Spirit.